That's right, I'm back again for a third video today talking about Throne of Eldraine spoilers. I just can't help myself. <music> Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. They just keep pouring the spoilers out and it's so whimsical and fun that I can't help myself. When I look at the cards that are coming out, they're genuinely fun in terms of flavor. Admittedly, certain cards kind of miss maybe on the power level with some of the stuff we're going to look at today, but overall, the whimsical nature of it, just the whole concept of this set is really striking a chord with me. I know that some people in the previous spoiler videos have been, I don't know if I'm feeling I'll dream, but I'll tell you, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it hard. So with that being said, let us dive in to talking about these fantastic looking cards. And we are gonna start out with Wishful Merfolk. So, Wishful Merfolk is one blue, one colorless for a three, two defender. So, two mana, you're getting something similar to Moat Piranhas when you look at the two, three defender aspect of it. Now, for a white and a colorless, Wishful Merfolk loses defender and becomes a human until end of turn. Now, that's funky. Most cards that lose defender don't really turn into another creature type. They usually just lose defender, maybe get some other, like this creature loses defender and gains first strike, but most of the time it's just lose defender, mobilizing the creature. So the artwork, I mean, you guys, you guys have to know what this is based on. You even got the red hair. This is based on the little mermaid and you can see it's, it's, it's a merfolk and she's up against some kind of underwater mirror or reflective surface looking at herself as a human and the artwork is gorgeous in all honesty i absolutely adore this artwork i love the way that their hair is flowing out in the water and even even the merfolk's hair is shown in a more idealized form in her reflection uh, just the idea of some sort of reflective service that shows you as what you want to be and allows you to transform into it is pretty amazing. I like the way that her merfolk fin tail and everything is flowing away in one direction and the dress is flowing away in the other, but they took the extra effort to show the dress parted so that you could see that she does indeed have human legs. And the whole idea is the mermaid basically gave up her mermaidiness to become a human so that she could go and find love with like a prince on land. That's the idea behind the original Little Mermaid. And I do have to say, the execution of the ability set on this creature is pretty sweet. I mean, on one hand, you do say, yes, not all merfolk have defender. Why does this have defender? But the idea of creatures being stuck in the water and unable to leave the water is represented in cards like Mo Piranhas and stuff like that, but it doesn't apply to all merfolk, but it makes it work here, where basically the defender makes her feel restricted. Attacking is essentially the same as going on land. She can only stay in her watery abode. But once you activate the ability, she loses defender and becomes a human. The transformation of being restricted to the water and being allowed to go on land. And it, honestly, it's nice, it's nice to see magic cards with beautiful ladies on them as well. I like this whole underwater kingdom, uh, obviously a merfolk princess becoming a merfolk human. Nope, a princess human style, there you go, that's what it is. But the flavor text is where it throws you a little bit of a twist. She yearned to walk on dry land so she might take her vengeance there. So instead of it being a love story, she is a merfolk who has some sort of vendetta against someone from the surface world. And that makes you wonder, what would have happened to this merfolk or her homeland for her to decide that she needed to go out and seek retribution? I like it. I like the flavor behind it a lot. And we actually have four more cards to talk about, all just dripping with fun flavor. Next up is Witch's Cottage. This is a land that counts as a swamp. And this isn't something you see very frequently in Magic the Gathering, where you have non-basic lands that aren't rare lands like the shock lands that actually count as a basic land as well. So this can be searched up with anything that would look for a swamp specifically. Now, Witch's Cottage enters the battlefield tapped unless you control three or more other swamps, and that's obviously just to restrict its power level. 
because the ability is when Witch's Cottage enters the battlefield untapped, you may put target creature card from your graveyard on top of your library. So it's got a grave digger effect that waits until you have access to four mana, but doesn't cost four mana. And the idea is that you have this bog witch who is, is basically helping you dredge up a corpse from the dead. And that is pretty cool. And the artwork is awesome. I love it. You've got this cottage. It's kind of in like a, in a swampy kind of bog. It almost feels like an island more than a swamp, albeit a little bit of a creepy Halloween island. This is a great piece of artwork to go with the Halloween concept. It definitely feels like uh, like a fairy tale, which is sort of cottage where it could kind of have, it, it has kind of a homey feel to it. It has kind of an inviting feel to it, even if it would be a terrible idea to go in there. I like that the, the trees are filled, I'm not sure if they're filled with fireflies or if there's some kind of fruit that these trees bear that these trees bear that make them glow like that. But I just I like the little pinpricks of light and warmth that throw sh that show through in the branches of the tree. I like the light coming out of the cozy looking cabin. I like the fact that the cabin has a bunch of pieces of wood jutting off at different angles. It kind of gives it more of an unruly feel. If it was perfectly ordered, it would make the co it would make the cottage feel more mundane and like it belonged in part of a town. But having the wood put up there, it, you could picture some kind of like witch hag, some kind of bog hag out there, just nailing boards up willy or nilly just to keep the drafts out or maybe to keep what they have trapped in. Either way, it is uh, it's some nice artwork that translates the feel of a witch's cottage, and I like the kind of stunted scraggly tree that's growing in the front with the I don't know brazier container maybe that's a glass bottle full of either fireflies or whatever essence is inside that tree is that is that why the witches choose to live out in the swamps in the bogs is it to harvest whatever energy is grown on these trees overall really really well done artwork I love it transmits a ton a ton of flavor and it's cool to see basic lands that actually feature uh, feature buildings like this as well, right? Because a lot of basic lands are just landscapes, which are beautiful, but it's nice to have this variety for a swamp. Now, after that, we've got Crystal Slipper. So we've got our Cinderella card here. One red, one colorless artifact equipment. This equipped creature gets plus one, plus zero, and has haste. It equips for one mana. After the death of her mother, Cassia found that things that appear fragile can be very strong indeed. And that's from Beyond the Great Henge. I don't know if Beyond the Great Henge is actually a real world work of literature, and uh, that's what it's drawn from, or if that's just a really a, a put together kind of quote that has the, the, the appearance of being a real world quote. Either way, it's done well. This is based off the Cinderella, the Cinderella myth, or the Cinderella fairy tale, what have you where Cinderella basically ends up with glass slippers as a result of an enchantment from her fairy godmother. The, fair, the enchantment runs out, and yet somehow, mystically, the, one of the crystal slippers is unaffected by the spell, the enchantment evaporating, and the crystal, the crystal shoe is used by a prince to go ahead and find Cinderella and rescue her from her life of trudgery and uh, misfortune, essentially. So this is obviously going to be a different take on it. This is combat oriented, clearly. And the artwork is actually really nice. The glass slipper, the crystal slipper, I should say, looks fantastic. You've got a crystalline rose that looks real on the top of it. And it's floating above a very interesting pedestal. The pedestal is, in all honesty, it looks like a fancy wedding cake. It looks like, it, it kind of looks like a fancy wedding cake. And that, that goes well with the concept of the glass slipper as well. I mean, obviously, uh, in the original style fairy tale, and this one, maybe not so much, but this is some sort of combat slipper that when you're not using it, you have it floating high in the air in a very inconvenient and weird manner. I, I don't know about that part, but it does make for very, very cool artwork where you can see the archway. Obviously, this is like, this is put near some kind of balcony or something, where you can see it overlooking flowing rivers and a night-filled starry kind of cloudy sky. It's very beautiful 
and picturesque in all honesty even if it is kind of weirdly odd it's it's a it's a weird decision to go, we've got this magical sliver, sliver. <laughs> I'm talking about slivers too much. Damn you, Lash! Anyhow, you've got this slipper, and we're just going to leave it over by the window. Yeah, who cares? Somebody wants to reach in and steal it. They can take our combat slipper. But I do like the, I do like the flavor text. I like that they use the flavor text to tie it together to make a crystal slipper as a combat item make sense. Where basically the concept is it may appear fragile, but it can be very strong indeed. So that that works for me. Overall, I find this a very inviting piece of artwork. After that, we've got Witching Well, which is a very fun play on the term Wishing Well. So this is another one of these, like the, the thing we just saw with the Crystal Slipper and this are both color-coded artifacts, color-aligned artifacts. And this is how things are going to be going forwards. The majority of artifacts Wizards of the Coast puts out will be color-aligned to avoid as much abuse and formats being broken. And honestly, I think it's a wise decision because a lot of the times the mistakes they make are with colorless cards. Now, let's take a look at Witching Well. One blue artifact, when it enters the battlefield, you scry two. You pay one blue and three colors, sacrifice Witching Well, draw two cards. The flavor text says, it was built by the Witch of Lochmere. Most of the wishes it grants are its own. Now this is a very interesting card. It's a it's a different take on blue card draw, similar similar to uh, to the spell bombs kind of back from the old Mirrodin days. It has some similarities. The whole sack it to draw cards, and it does kind of mirror some of the lands we saw in Dominaria as well. But either way, it gives it a unique identity. On top of that, the fact that it's an artifact can be combined with other things, like for example Oko who I talked about in the first spoiler video of the day, he would actually combine perfectly with Witching Well, because when you use them, you've already gotten the benefit from the scry. So that's not that's not too shabby at all. And you can hand it off to an opponent who might not even be playing blue. So you can just go, here is a useless card. It's basically blank. I will take this. So that is a good use for the card, aside from its obvious just normal use as... I mean, it's five mana overall to draw two cards and scry two, which feels steep, but... This is also a random common. Now, when we take a look at the artwork, the artwork's fantastic. I don't know exactly what it is in the background there. It looks like there is a werewolf just lurking in the background. This artwork does have a very blue feel to it with all the water you can see behind it, the little the little mountains kind of coming up out of the islands back there. It's, I mean, this, this could actually be like black blue as well. It does have that kind of dark feel to it with the, uh, the way the trees are all around it but it should have a kind of a dark feel to it because it's a well that was made by a witch and the idea behind it i mean i love i love that you can see that there's energy glowing up all out of it but there's all these little like almost embers of magical energy from the witching well spewing all over the place so presumably that's the knowledge that you gain from drawing upon this well but i find the flavor text to be very playful it was built by the witch of lochmere most of the wishes it grants are its own. So it will sometimes grant wishes for other people, but it has its own sentience and its own agenda, and it wants to grant its own wishes. And that is that is a pretty cool concept. Sometimes having things that are sentient that, that normally wouldn't be adds an extra dimension. Sometimes it's boring. But I find with this particular one that this is a win for me. Witching Well is it's well named i really all oh, look at me making terrible jokes no, not even meaning to either way this is a fantastically fun card not not the most powerful but just from the concept of it is fun and the last card we're going to talk about is actually a lot of fun too and that's run away together and actually looking at the guy from this artwork he might be the one who was lurking around in the well back behind the well i should say maybe he wished for a friend but this is fun one blue one colors instant choose two target creatures controlled by different players return those creatures to their owner's hands. And the flavor text says, virtue is virtue, whatever the heart that nurtures it. And that's Malakan Vantress Exile. So we have here some sort of hide hideous, misshapen uh, monstrosity. This might be your Quasimodo hunchback of Notre Dame nod. That might be what's going on here, where he is running off with a regular happy looking human. But just the carefree nature of it, where you have these two just 
running off through a field together, all carefree and yay, we're free, let's go. Great adventure awaits us. It's just, it's fun, man. Admittedly, it's like, I don't know, Disney-esque, but I really like, for me, I'm giving Throne of Eldraine a pass on certain things just because I'm so happy to have a departure from the Gatewatch and not following them constantly to just explore a new world. And all of these cards feel so individual. All these cards feel like they have their own lives and they're not all interconnected automatically. So it adds more depth to me than the, 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 the when it's all synergy and it's like, all right, Cult of Goat, this guy, and Cult of Goat, that guy, and Cult of Goat, that guy, and it's like, that's boring. That's boring, this is fun. And it's interesting to note that this is a card that's definitely better in multiplayer. In a two-player game, this is like a terrible unsummon. Unsummon will let you return one creature for a blue, so you can just go boom, get rid of your guy, or save my guy. In a two-player game, this is literally like, okay, wait, I have to bounce one of my guys to even be able to use this? This is terrible in compared to Unsummon. But when you're playing a three-player game and you can go ahead and use the um, the fact that you're playing against multiple opponents, you go, I'm going to nail each of your creatures. Man, I don't know if you guys can hear it through the camera, but my neighbor's bass is real, boy. It's, it's banging through here. So I'll try and put the noise reduction on the video, but I don't know. If you hear some beats in the back, I don't, I'm not launching. I'm not launching a rap career over here. I, although I do have what it takes. Anyhow, let's uh, let's you and me run away together to the next part of the video here. So, my friends, at this point, I want to thank my patrons and my channel members. If you haven't already watched the other two spoiler videos I put out today, I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at those as well because this set is shaping up to be a lot of fun, and I look forward to talking about more of the cards from this set. So if you want to subscribe for more, feel free to do so. That is up to you. My thanks to my patrons and channel members. Appreciate everything you do. And remember, together, we are the sixth color of magic.